It's good to have you all here. Uh, if there are any visitors, um, keep in mind that there's pew pads uh, on the inside, and if you're sitting by one, pass it on so the visitors have an opportunity to say hi. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And in that line, for those of you who are interested in a membership here at Calvary, uh, this is one week when you can make that a reality, and that's because on, on uh, Thursday night, we are going to have uh, a reception or a, a little orientation for anyone who's inter interested in a new membership here. And uh, so that information is here in your bulletin if you take a look at it. It happens to be the same day as our ice cream social. Isn't that just a son of a gun? But anyway, um, it, they're both going to happen on the same evening. Now, if you're, if you're interested in membership and you haven't received anything yet, because I think our letters have just gone out, please let us know, because it's not too late. Give the office a call, and we'll certainly um, uh, make sure that you can become part of this uh, congregation. Uh, so I, I mentioned the ice cream social. Well, that's going to be from 4 to 7 on Thursday, and that's, that's become um, uh, a fairly regular and a highly popular event, so uh, please consider uh, that as well. And uh, also, you probably noticed there's, a, there's an insert in your bulletin about the call committee. <clears throat> now, many of you know that this is an interim period here at Calvary, and I am the interim senior pastor, which means I am here for only a, a certain period of time. And there will be a call going out to a senior pastor uh, for the position that's available here. The call committee is active. I mean, I, I realize that sometimes it seems like uh, things just kind of quiet down and become silent, but that doesn't mean there's nothing going on. Uh, just like God in our lives, you know, uh, sometimes we think to ourselves, well, was God hiding on us or something? Um, the committee's very busy, and um, they're uh, approaching these next few months, I think, with some vigor uh, because they have redone the profile for the church, and um, they just want you to know that, that they're continuing on um, with the hopes of finding a senior pastor. Now, there is a couple of things that you can do, and that's one of, and that actually there's listed on that pamphlet. They indicate that, the, that not only um, can you recommend someone, but the Senate can recommend someone uh, to the call committee, or of course, uh, another pastor can, can stop in and mention something as well that they might be interested. So you can take uh, part, of, uh, part of this as well with you. So please do that. Take it seriously. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to uh, mention our condolences to the family and friends of Helen Larson. I think many of you uh, would know Helen uh, and her husband, Kermit. Kermit passed away here a couple of years ago, and now Helen has passed away. And her funeral will be here tomorrow morning at 11.30, if you would like to come and say hi to the family and, um, and offer your condolences. Certainly the family will be in our prayers. Uh, I understand there is a visitation. There will be a brief visitation here before the service, but I believe there's also one at the funeral home this evening from, I believe it's from 6 to 8. Um, if the time is critical for you, just give the funeral home a call and they'll let you know. Um, that is all the announcements that I have, so let's continue with our worship. As we continue with the song we gather, we'll be doing two songs in a row this morning. We gather in a new one that we just learned, uh, or we just went through my lighthouse. We'd ask you to rise during this one, and I'm going to ask you to sit during the second one so that you can follow along and learn. As you're able, please rise and join with us as we sing We Gather.
go to our next song, which is My Lighthouse. Let's pray. Oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and, and all just works. So give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now we'll have some special music. As travel along on the Jericho Road Was well, there room for this too 
brother don't carry no load Just bring it to Christ You said your mom's confess On the Jericho road Your precious heart he will bless Well on the Jericho road Well there's room for just two Well no more no less Talk about Jesus and you Each bread and you bear Well each sorrow or his share Well there's never a care Where precious Jesus is there He'll call you the same at Jesus' command. The sin judgment must fall on the Jericho road. He will answer your call while on the Jericho road. Well, there's room for this too. Well, no more, no less. Talk about Jesus and you. Well, each burden you bear, well, each sorrow you share, there's never a care. Precious Jesus is there. lesson is from the book of the prophet Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see? I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from, this, away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. A reading from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. 
He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if we have children that would like to come up for a children's message. <coughs> How are you guys? Good? Cool. You want to sit over there? How did I know that? <laughs> I can't even stand by a cushion, you know, they know. <clears throat> okay, you guys, I have a question for you. And this is a good one. Do you ever think that God could come to you and ask you to do something specific for him? You think, you think yes. Good. How about yes? Yeah? Yeah? Yes. Yes? It's really good you think that because in our Old Testament reading today, we read about one of the prophets, and you know, that's, that's what God uses when he wants to convey a message to a group of people. He'll get somebody to speak for him. Do you think that God could ever come to you and say, ah, I'd like you to tell some people something for me. They may not like it, but I still want you to tell them. Would you be willing to tell those people that? Yeah. Would you do that for God? That's really good that you would do that. Because, believe it or not, if you think it can't happen, well, you're wrong. It can happen. It, and Chances are, in your lifetime, it will happen. And sometimes it'll happen, and then you'll look back and you'll think, wow, but you know, a couple of days ago, I just realized that God asked me to do something and I just did it. God works in some very interesting ways, and he picks some very interesting people to do his work. In our reading this morning, he picked a herdsman. This is someone who is just roams around out in the pasture and, and uh, keeps the herds together, whether they be goats or sheep, but they keep, that's all he does. That's all he does. And all of a sudden, God just came out and said, Amos, I want you. You're going to go to that country up north and you're going to tell them that things aren't going to be going so well for you anymore because you've gotten away from me. You don't listen to me anymore. So Amos, I want you to give them a warning. That's how God works. God did the same thing for me. I was 50 years old. 50. Right? I was 50 years old, and I thought I was all done with school, and you know what God said to me? God said, no, you're not done with school. You're going back to school. And of course, I had to talk to God about that. But, but that's okay, too. God will do some interesting things in your life. He will ask you to do things for him. Don't be surprised when it happens. It doesn't matter who you are, okay? Okay. Should we pray? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for using us. For everything that you want us to do. And for telling the people around us what your wishes are. So use me, Lord, and take me. Just promise to care for me when I'm afraid. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, you guys. As you're able, we'd ask that you please rise for the gospel refrain and then the reading of the gospel. gospel reading on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost is found in the sixth chapter of Mark. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, ah, it's Elijah. And others said, it's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Well, immediately then she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. Well, the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard of his oaths and for the guest, he did not want to confuse her or refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. It's the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <laughs> Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, we're awfully proud of our court system. It's said to be one of the greatest achievements in the world. It's the one place where the truth is spoken. Uh, we're sworn, in fact, we're sworn in with the very words, do you solemnly 
uh, uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And, of course, some add, so help me God. It is a form of social justice that seems like such a good thing. Both God and Amos should be proud of what we've accomplished in our legal arena. After all, it was the prophet Amos whose primary interest rested in social justice as well as religious arrogance. But really, it may be the best system around, but how many of you have have watched some of the more famous murder trials, some of which have even been on television, listening to how the defense and the prosecution can present the truth in so many different ways. In fact, one of the most popular quotes comes out of the movies. Uh, this was a, a courtroom scene from 1992. Um, a few good men. It was Jack, I'm sure many of you have seen this, it's a great show. Uh, Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, they're having this court battle of a lifetime. And then finally, it reaches, it reaches this peak, and Jack Nichols, Nicholson shouts out, the truth, you can't handle the truth, he goes. But shouldn't the truth just be some kind of a simple sentence? I mean, I mean a, a statement of fact, or something at least not to be feared? Well, maybe Jack is telling the truth. Maybe we're just not good at handling the truth. I mean, just consider all the places that the truth really gets in the way. Okay, and, and I'm sure some of you have probably been in some of these. For those of you who have, been, uh, who have been at a board meeting or a staff meeting or even a committee meeting, and the topic that you're working on, the things that you're dealing with, it's going very well. And then all of a sudden the conversation starts heading south a little bit and you end up talking about the boss. Now, how, do, how well does the truth roll off your lips now? Um, when another person comes to you and they ask you about something that you have said that offended them and they ask you about it, how do you word your explanation. And then, of course, we can always turn to politics, right? For something like this, we can go, well, from the president all the way down to our local officials. When they start, or, or leaders of other countries, for that matter, they begin with these campaign promises, and they just keep going, and they talk about each other, and they accuse each other. Do you even see those statements as truthful at all? Or have we become conditioned with so much half-truth that nothing of it really matters anymore? You have to wonder, with the way our news reporting has changed from reporting the facts to reporting one's opinion, and with all the ways that we have come to justify the molding and the, and the fashioning of the truth to make it more palatable, do we even recognize the truth anymore? Do we? The gospel lesson today. Great example of the truth that's gone absolutely wild. King Herod. He knew that it wasn't right to marry his brother's wife. He knew it. And all John the Baptist did was simply make it public information. It was the truth. There were no lies. None of these long grapevines that kind of distort stuff. It was just a matter of fact truth. And what happened? Well, it really embarrassed the king. And of course, the king didn't like the threat to his power. So John lost his head. Literally. On account, on account of the truth. And there's no reason to believe that war or famine or oppression and a great deal of death hasn't taken place in our modern world for similar reasons of power and of might. I mean, the truth is really hard to handle. It's hard for countries, it's hard for institutions, and it's hard for you and I. And one of the greatest fears of all is that one day 
we will become so good at manipulating the truth that it will simply lie silent and meaningless. God's relationship with the people of Israel followed just that path. Israel became this powerful nation. They, they grew, they became wealthy, they, and they did so by their own design. They were so proud of themselves. But faith in God suffered, and it became silent. Well, faith in themselves, of course, huh, soared. That's, where the, that's what prospered. Justice fell to arrogance, and the truth fell to oppression. Does any of that sound familiar? God felt it was time to round them up and anchor their feet to the ground again. So he gathers up a simple herdsman by the name of Amos to remind the people that if it's separation that they seek from God, well, then it's separation they shall receive. Except it's going to be in the form of exile. Now this message, of course, was the truth. It was the truth. So Amos delivered it to the priest, the priest of Israel. The priest of Israel passed it on to the king, but the truth, you know, sometimes is pretty hard to handle, especially when you're a king. I mean, interestingly enough, the king of Israel knew that what Amos was saying was true. He knew it. He just literally couldn't handle it. You got to picture it, though. You got to picture this little herdsman guy walking into this glamorous castle. The king's sitting there. He's walking up to the king and passing on this information from God, right? Telling him that if he doesn't change his ways, his country is going to be destroyed. Now, is that a message or a similar message? Would you take a similar message like that into your boardroom or into your committee or? Remember, though, it has to be the truth. It has to be the truth, not a half-truth, not part of the truth, not some of the truth, not truth with a little bit of opinion in it, not some belief that you have, not opinion at all. The truth. So the king did what anyone would do under those circumstances. He just said, move on. He ignored it. Get out of my country. Go prophesy someplace else. Here's the interesting thing, though. Uh, If you follow what happens to Israel, what Amos prophesied was definitely true, and it did come true, because 40 years later, Israel was destroyed by Assyria, and the people were exiled to that country. Happened. If you want to reground yourself in truth, the prophets are really a great place to go to to spend some time because the words of God are indeed true. They're true. And it's just refreshing. It's refreshing to know that those very words that God spoke through the prophets are an actual window into what's important to God. You can actually, it's like you could see what God really wants. And all that God has offered us, everything is truth. But many Christians still must misunderstand biblical prophecy. They see it as, oh, it's fortune-telling, you know, when in fact what it really is is truth-telling. It's plain and simple truth-telling. Prophecy is not the result of seeing into the future. Instead, prophecy is the faithful declaration of how current actions, things we're doing right now, are going to affect the future. And the prophecy is said with the hope of having an impact on both of those things, on both the present and the future. The plumb line that God talks about that's used to to assess the righteousness of his people 2,800 years ago, that hasn't changed. Oh, today we might call it a laser level or something like that. Still the same measurement. God speaks the truth. God has not gone away. God's not hiding. God hasn't disappeared or left or something. God is here today. The words that Amos spoke and all the other prophets spoke, they are true. 
and they apply to us today as well as to our future. But as we place ourselves into that Old Testament story with Amos and Herod, ask yourself, where best do we fit? We as a nation, maybe as a church, or as individuals, how well are we really handling the truth today? You know, speaking the truth by no means guarantees acceptance either. I guess that makes it difficult as well. The truth is always going to be uncomfortable to somebody. It just does. And if it does disturb someone in power, well, it becomes even more uncomfortable. But that's why you have to rely on the very word of God and the prophets for guidance. For the truth was meant to refresh us with God's intent for us. So, the truth may be hard to handle, but it's certain to do one thing. And that is to prevent us from becoming a people who thinks that we, we have things so well under control that we no longer need Christ in our lives. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us to see the truth and accept it. Help us to speak the truth and honor it. And help us to help you pass your message of love and hope and truth to everyone. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. You may remain seated during this song. Lord of Justice. stand if you're able. Let's join together and confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the union of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Growing in faith and discipleship, we give thanks for God's mercy, merciful compassion as we pray for the church, for the world, and for all in need. God of truth, put your word of justice on our lips. Bless your church in the task of holy resistance. And make us a living and persistent sign of your righteousness and your loving kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of heaven and earth, pour your healing power upon our fragile earth for us and for all who will inherit it. Inspire the work of all those who seek unsustainable uh, sources of energy, food, and clean water. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our God of justice, hold your plumb line to the nations. Speak convicting words of holy judgment and truth to those in positions of authority. Redeem all harms caused by corruption and the hunger for power, and restore peace to our world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our God of salvation, bring wholeness to all your beloved children. Bring abundance of life to all who long for healing. We especially lift up those who have suffered loss of a loved one or a friend. We especially remember Helen Larson family, and all those on our prayer chain, as well as all those that we silently list in our hearts. Gracious Lord, we seek to be a prayerful people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we lift to you these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your everlasting love and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As members of God's household, I pray that the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And let's share God's peace. And we'll continue with our morning offering.
understand. Gracious God, let's pray together. Gracious God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. So come, let us eat, for now the feast has been spread. Our Lord's table has been prepared, and all are welcome. Please be seated.
stand if you're able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.